All right, good morning. We are glad that you are here with us, and we are continuing our series this morning called Foundations. And last week we talked about being alone and being lonely and the difference there, and today we're going to talk about friends and how to pick the right ones and how to avoid the wrong ones, and and we're going to talk pretty bluntly and openly this morning, and so um, let's pray, and I've got a couple stories to tell you. Father, thank you so much for being with us and letting us be here with you and letting us be here with each other. So, Father, we anticipate always that you have um, the desire to speak truth into us and to change us, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So, Father, give us hearts and minds to hear from you this morning. I ask that you would hide me behind the cross of Jesus so that you are seen and heard and I am not. Father, we anticipate and we look forward to what you will do in us, with us, and through us this morning. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Amen. So we're, today we're going to talk about friends as part of foundations, and um, th- the shirt that I have on, I have never gotten as many comments about any shirt I've ever worn as this shirt. Now, it's only relevant because of what I'm about to tell you. Uh, I was gone last week. I was out of town with a group of guys that I travel with sometimes. At least once a year, we travel together and we go play golf. And this one friend in particular... Uh, a couple weeks before the trip, he and I were on the same team, and he was our team captain, and Paul said, we should dress alike. And I said, no, we shouldn't. We should, and he just meant he and I, not the whole team, just he and I. And I said, because we have some of the same shirts. And I said, no, I, I don't think we should. This is not going to end well for us. The men that we have as friends on this trip are cruel, and we will never... And I'm all good with that. I, I love teasing and making fun and being made fun of and all that stuff. I'm easy to make fun of. So I'm like, okay, let's do that. Now, for three days, three days, Paul and I wear the same shirts and shorts for three days. And there were many times, where, there were at least a couple of times, where we played together. We were in the same cart together. Walk to the same green together. On the tee box together. It took eight or nine hours before any of our friends even noticed that we dressed alike. (laughs) Why? Because we're men. That's exactly why. So when they finally noticed, you know, Paul and I just denied it. Like, no, this wasn't planned. What are you talking about? That's No, we didn't do this on purpose. Now, having said that, let me tell you this. We're continuing our series uh, called Foundations. Next week, we're going to talk about men, and the week after that, we're going to talk about women. So, yes, so either that's a warning to you or an incentive to you, whichever one you need it to be. So, uh, I miss you all last week. Of course, I listened to David's sermon online, et cetera, et cetera, and and we're going to talk about friends today, and so I have to talk about my friends and who those people are and, and the level of those friendships and some of that, and some of them will probably watch this today. So when we talk about our close relationships, sometimes we use the word friend the same way we use the word love, right? Like if I said, what's your favorite food? Some of you would say, like, um, we love Thai food. David and I love Thai food. Love it. And David and Paul and I meet for lunch every week. Every Wednesday we meet for lunch. And David and I have a little bit more flexibility than Paul, so we try to meet somewhere over closer to here or whatever. But this is what you need to know. Whenever Paul can't make it, (laughs) David and I go to Florence for Thai food. Every single time. And so um, I love Thai food. I also love my kids. Is that the same? No. Okay. So sometimes we use friend in the same way. You know, you have people that are really just kind of a closer acquaintance that you will call friends. But then you also have people that are really close to you that you call friends too. Are they the same? No, they're not. But you use that word fairly generically. And so today we'll talk about um, what that looks like on a deeper level. Now, currently on tour is a band uh, that's been around probably since the 60s, certainly 70s, called War. They're currently touring. And their most famous and popular song is that one. 
Why can't we be friends? Why can't we, right? Okay, so that, that I'm sorry you had to hear that, but um, it just dawned on me what that probably sounded like to you. Um, that phrase is the dominant phrase in that entire song. As a matter of fact, the verses are just like two lines. That's it. And it repeats that phrase over and over and over again. Now, when you listen to the song and you pay attention to it or you read the lyrics, the song really talks about all the things that people have in common and the things that make them different. So he asks the question, well, why can't we be friends? We could be friends because we have these so many things in common. We're so alike. Or we can't be friends because we are so different on all these other levels. And so... David and I share a very good friend who you, you've heard me talk about Mark. Mark has, has moved away. I see Mark every now and then, talk to Mark every now and then. Love Mark. Mark and I are friends, really good friends. The things that make us good friends are all the things that we have in common and all the common passion we share. We have a very similar faith system and what we believe about God and the Bible. And there's a couple of things that Mark and I disagree on. And we talk about those. Mark doesn't get mad that I disagree with him, and I don't get Mark mad that Mark disagrees with me either. We just don't get mad. I mean, because we understand that there are so many things that we love and appreciate about each other, bigger, better things than the things that we will disagree on. So when we talk about foundations, we have to have a foundation for our relationships. And sometimes as you have relationships, just because you work with somebody, you're not having them over for dinner, right? You're not going to associate with them, but you have a work friendship. and Or maybe it's a, like some of my relationships are golf friendships. There's other stuff I'm involved in that our, our relationship revolves around that. But we all have and we need those relationships that are a deeper level. And that's somewhat of what we're going to talk about today. And how to navigate through cultivating really good relationships. And also understanding negative ones and bad ones and having good boundaries. So 1 Corinthians 15.33, one of my favorite fundamental foundational verses, don't be fooled, don't be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Now in this room, most of us have lived long enough to have had bad company. Not the band, um, even though I'm a fan, but we've had friends that were negative influences on us. And we didn't realize it until we already got in trouble, right? You have a friend that you knew when you were hanging out, like, oh, we're going to get in trouble. And that's why you hung out with them, right? Because sin is fun. Every adult in here knows sin is fun, but it's not free. And the consequences of that behavior sometimes last a lifetime. Bad friends, don't kid yourself. Bad friends corrupt good character. And we'll talk about this specifically for men and women in the next couple of weeks. But ladies, if you have close friends that constantly bash their husbands, it's going to rub off on you. Men, if you have close friends that constantly bash their wives, it's going to rub off on you. Now, you may have that association. They may not be a close friend. And, and you look at that and go, man, I'm glad my wife isn't like her. Or, man, I'm glad my husband doesn't do that. Or, oh, yeah, my husband's a jerk too. Oh, my wife is a great lady. <laughs> but you understand how that those conversations take place in your circles, right? And now, be as transparent as we can possibly be. If you're the man in the group that when that's happening and you step up and you go, my wife doesn't act like that. Man, my wife's great. All of a sudden, you're the outlier, right? Or ladies, oh no, my husband, my husband doesn't act like that. My husband doesn't talk to me. My husband's a great guy. Man, my husband loves God. My husband loves me. Like, you're the outlier. Now that group of friends looking at you going, shut up. <laughs> We're trying to commiserate here. And you're shining light on this, and we don't like it. And then pretty soon, you're just not included in that anymore. Guess what? You're not missing anything. You're not missing anything. You're just not. Bad company corrupts good character. And the, and the opposite is true. Good company builds good character. 
So we need to be deliberate and we need to be careful. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 12, 12, 26 says, A righteous man is cautious in friendships. Be careful about who you associate with. You become them. But the way of the wicked leads them astray. The, the right person, the person who is measuring relationships and friendships in the right way, is careful. It's careful who they associate with. But if you're not careful who you associate with, you will run with idiots. Back when I was growing up in church, the statement was, it's hard to soar like an eagle when you run with turkeys. That's a true statement. It's a true statement. Now, if I love people. Love people. I love to meet new people. I will sit as I will go places alone and sit by myself and talk to anybody and everybody. That is a the, the, that the partly is the way I'm a middle child, so that's partly that, but it's also the way God made me. I'm an evangelist by nature, and I love to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. I love to have those interactions and those conversations, and and I pray wherever I am, like God. Put me by somebody who wants to talk about Jesus. I'll talk about all kinds of stuff. I'll talk about golf and football and baseball and all kinds of stuff. I'll talk about all kinds of things, but eventually we're going to talk about Jesus. Because the last I checked, nobody got to heaven by being a good golfer. If that were true, I don't have a prayer. (laughs) But I know Jesus. And I know that while I was yet a sinner, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And as Paul mentioned earlier, man, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth knowing everything I would ever do, knowing every sin I would ever commit, knowing every thought, knowing every failure, knowing all of that, and he died on the cross for me anyway. And I do believe that Jesus, I made this, I made the statement this week, um, okay, I got to tell you some other stories. It's golf related. I had a match this Thursday, and we won our match. And my partner t- he had to leave, so now I'm just sitting in the clubhouse with the, with this other guy on the other team. And he brings up out of the blue his. I said, "Oh, we talked about his children. This guy's a really good golfer. He's probably one of the top ten golfers in the club that I play at. His name's Will. I know, I know, I know. It's irony. One of the really good ones. One of the really bad ones, but." And so I asked about his kids. He said, oh, my kids go to blah, blah, blah. And his youngest goes to um, a daycare, a preschool in in the area where I live. He said, yeah, she came home talking about, um, you know, that Jesus was God and Jesus died on the cross to pay for her sins. And she's like four. And my friend does not attend church. And this was not a religious preschool. And he goes, yeah, she came up talking to the story. And I'm like, I'm going, okay, Lord, let's, let's kick this door open. Let's run through it because this is going to be really fun. And so he said, but my wife, doesn't, um, my wife doesn't know what to do with it. I was, like, I was like, okay. He said, yeah, because she's kind of an atheist, kind of. I said, okay, let's understand. Nobody's really an atheist. If you believe it's wrong to steal, then you, you can't be an atheist. If you think it's wrong to murder, you can't be an atheist because you're living your life by a moral code. And you can't have a moral code without a moral code giver. You can't. So, I, so he's like, yeah, the whole talk about Jesus. And I was like, well, Will, I'm one of the guys who believe that Jesus is the greatest phenomenon to have ever crossed the horizon of this world. So you are, I'm, I'm a Kool-Aid drinker. I drank that Kool-Aid, and I go back for it. I love that truth. And so I'm just this conversation, man, and it just explodes, and it's he and I, and talking about who Jesus is, and what we think about that, and, and um, then some other guys join the conference, some other, three other men come in and sit down at the table, because we're the only people in the room, so they sit with us, and one of the guys uh, just played in a national tournament, and he sits down with us, and he, and Kevin knows what I do for a living, and he knows about you all, because I talk about you all, and, and um, it's really quiet now, because Will doesn't know how to navigate through this conversation with these strangers. I, I'm going to puke it up, man. We're going to talk about Jesus, whoever is here, because he really is the greatest phenomenon to ever cross the horizon of this world. We'll talk about golf and how good you are, but we're going to talk about Jesus. But sometimes our culture defines our Christianity, and it can't. It can't. Because 
our culture, you know, where we are and who we are and what we do with those people. Uh, my Christianity needs to define my culture. It needs to define my friendships. Most of my friends are non-believers. Most of my friends don't go to church. Most of my friends couldn't tell you what John 3.16 says unless they happen to see it at a sporting event or it's on a beer can, which doesn't happen. Most of my friends, again, we're using the term friend there pretty loosely, are defined by whoever they are, wherever they go, their background, their raising. But my culture can't define my Christianity. I can't not be a believer just because I'm in this group. No, 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 no. This is who I am. This is what I do. And so if you're with me around some of those people, my, my longstanding rule is this. I don't care what cuss words you use. I don't care. Most cuss words, cuss words are cultural. They didn't exist when Jesus was on the earth, right? So a lot of the words we use, they're just cultural stuff. But taking the Lord's name in vain, that's a no-no. We don't do that. So you can drop all kinds of words all day long, but not GD. So when somebody says, Jesus Christ, and I go, I don't think he had anything to do with that. And then that's a conversation. So if you're with me around those people and they, and they drop, they take the Lord's name in vain, you will see them go, I'm sorry, Brother Will. Now, they're also the only ones who call me Brother Will, right? You know, I'm just Will to everybody else, which I really like, and which I think is appropriate, and I, I appreciate that some people call me that, and David that as a, out of respect. I love that. I, I would never ask you to change that, but most people, it's just Will. But these guys, especially if they use GD, oh, I'm sorry, Brother Will. I'm like, man, thank you for apologizing. That's important to me. But my culture cannot define my Christianity. So my culture about my friends and who my friends are, the close friends, the distant friends, the acquaintances, my Christianity, my faith in Christ needs to define what those things look like. So that plays a part in every part of our relationship. And if you're of an age where you, your kids are grown or maybe you have grandkids or whatever that is, one of the things that shows up in our relationships is how we teach kids about friendship. And we'll talk about this when we talk about parenting. But this week I was driving down the road and, and this statement came to mind. Do not put your kids' popularity over their purity. Let that sink into you. So when the guy says, you know, I, I know that my friends or my son's friends are bad influences on him, but why but? There shouldn't be a but there. Well, I can't choose my, 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 my children's friends. Yeah, you can. You have their whole life. Yeah. Just because they can drive now doesn't mean that you can't have an influence on who they associate with. Because most likely, you could just take their keys. And no, you can't go there because stuff happens at that place that you should not be involved in. But then your kids won't be as popular. Oh, because that's the most important thing. The popularity of your children. Really? So you don't let them be and go and hang out with people that are absolutely horrible influences. I had a guy tell me one time, well, I know that, I know they're a bad influence on my son, but, but I can't choose. Yeah, you have just confessed that that friend is a bad influence on your child, but yet you will still take them over to that kid's house and let them hang out. You'll let them go there after school. You'll let them... Why? Because you want your kid to be popular. So they make bad choices, not just about sexual behavior, but about alcohol, about all other kinds of stuff. Because you want them to be popular. That's messed up, isn't it? That's not... That's very simple common sense. So I'm going to tell you, and we're going to read one of the most horrific stories in all of Scripture. It's gut-wrenching, and it is bad from beginning to end. And it's in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Now David has more than one wife, and so he has a bunch of children, sons and et cetera, et cetera, daughters, and, and they um, are half, 
half-brothers, half-sisters. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. So the half-sister, half-brother, half-sister, you understand that. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible. Now listen to what we read next. It seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Okay, hopefully by now, just from what you've read, you kind of have a sick feeling in your stomach, as you should. It was impossible for him to do anything to her. Now, Amnon is the son of the king. He can find a wife anywhere. Wait, you mean I get to be a princess? Sign me up. But because Amnon is so depraved, now Amnon had a friend, it's a very important word, had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. Hmm. So this is nephew. Jonadab was a very shrewd Man. He asked Amnon, Why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me, Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my, sis, my brother Absalom's sister. Hmm. It's bad enough that we will that we struggle with our own stuff, right? Struggle with our own desire to make right choices, to do things that honor God. But if you have associations, if you have friends, that serving God isn't even in their radar, it's going to make it so much harder for us to do the right things. So, Jonadab helped Amnon hatch a plan to rape his sister told you this story starts bad and gets worse. His friend helps him form a plan to rape his own half-sister. Really? Bad company corrupts good character. And Amnon didn't start out with great character. He's already on the downward slide. And he has this friend who makes it worse. Now you notice... Amnon does not go to anybody else. He doesn't go to his father and say, man, dad, I'm really struggling. I need help. He doesn't go to Absalom and say, man, Absalom, I, I'm in love with my half-sister, and I don't know what to do about this. And He doesn't go to anybody who's going to help him make a right choice. He surrounds himself with people, Jonadab, who is only going to help him make life altering and ultimately a life ending choice bad friends corrupt good character now we most of the time we're tempted to apply that to children right we look at our kids and go man that you need to have better friends you need to have friends that love god you but as adults husbands and wives and whether you're married or single you need to have the right people around you that are feed you good stuff Are you going to live a life that honors God? Is that choice honoring God? Then stop doing that. If you have a struggle with doing that, then then let's fight this fight together. But if all of your friends are knuckleheads, you're going to be a knucklehead. If all your friends live a life that doesn't honor God, then you're going to end up living a life that doesn't honor God. As I've said, a lot of my acquaintances are not believers. And that's intentional on my part. Man, I love you guys. I talk about my church, and I talk about you guys by name all the time. And But I want to see people come to Jesus. So if you're here this morning, and you've already done that, you need to know you're just not on my radar. I will love you. I will pastor you. I will disciple you. I will do all those things, and so will David. But we will live the Great Commission. We will go into all the world. That is your neighborhood and my neighborhood and and your grocery store and my grocery store. We will go into those worlds and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel constantly. Use use words if necessary. So Amnon um, has a friend. 
And so that's what happens. They, they hatch a plan so to get Tamar alone. And that's what he does. He rapes his half-sister. And as you know what sin is like, as soon as that is over, he hates her. And he throws her out. And she's begging him, don't do this. Don't make one thing worse than the other. Don't do this. And he orders his servants to throw her out and lock the door. So Tamar goes to Absalom. Tells him what happened. And Absalom, Absalom holds on to that for two years. Two years. They don't go to David. They don't do anything. There's no obvious retribution. There's no downside for Amnon for two years. Two years. Now, it comes a time of the year when they're going to shear sheep. And they have this big party. And Amnon says, let's throw a party and invite all the king's sons. Let's get everybody together. Feels very magnanimous, feels very welcoming, you know. Let's all get together. Let's get all the siblings together, all the brothers. And so that's what he does. And Amnon is kind of coerced into coming. And in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 28 to 32, Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is high in spirits, when Amnon's drunk, and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then you kill him. Don't be afraid. After all, I'm the king's son, remember? Don't be afraid. Have I not given you this order? Or haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. Verse 28. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Two years. Absalom says, this won't go unnoticed and this won't go unpunished for what you did to my sister. Two years goes by. Then all the king's sons got up mounted their mules and fled. While they were on their way, the report came to David, Absalom has struck down all the king's sons so that none of them is left. Now you and I know the story, that's not what happened. But that's what gets back to David. Then the king stood up, tore his clothes, lay down on the ground, and all of his servants stood by him with their clothes torn as well. So David hears that all of his sons are dead. He has no successor to the throne. All his life is coming, crashing down around him. And he mourns and he weeps. Now, verse 32, we get introduced to this guy again. Do you remember Jonadab, the friend? But Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother, said, My lord should not, should not think that they killed all the princes. Only Amnon is dead. This has been Absalom's expressed intention ever since the day Amnon raped his sister Tamar. Huh. Isn't that interesting that this is Jonadab's plan, but he gets off scot-free? So we need to be very careful about our friends because when reckoning comes, it probably won't influence them just you bad friends corrupt good character i told you this story goes from bad to worse you see somebody who does a horrible thing and absolutely they get from strictly a dad standpoint well, he had that coming but not the friend jonadab is a horrible human being and it doesn't seem like he suffers at all does it Bad friends corrupt good character. Amnon had a friend. Had a friend. So let me ask you, who is close to you? Who is close to you? I'm going to make a statement now that I'm going to make when we talk about marriage. Do not give your heart to someone who, if God doesn't have theirs... Do not give your heart to someone if God doesn't have theirs. So let's apply that to friends. Man, the, the people I let close to me, does God have their heart? Does God work through them? Do they speak words of truth to me? Do they point me to God's word? Do they encourage me? Do they challenge me? Do they correct me? Do they hold me accountable for my behavior, for my words? And if they do, do I embrace them or do I push them away? Oh, you don't know me. Okay, I know what you're doing. 
I know what you said. Well, I didn't mean that. Well, what did you mean? Enlighten me. Tell me what you meant. Do our friends push us closer to God? Do they sharpen us? One of the most interesting sections of Scripture, I think, about friendship is this, and it's James chapter 2, verse 23. And the Scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was credited or reckoned to him as righteousness. So Abraham didn't just be, wasn't just a good guy. He believed what God said, and, he was, and that equated to righteous behavior in his life. And he was called the friend of God. I refer people to a bunch of places all the time. Whether it's a restaurant I know go to or whatever. And I say to them, when you call these people, tell them you know me. They will treat you really, really well. Because these people are my friends in some cases. But tell them you know me. It will matter. So for Abraham to be called God's friend... That, to me, is so intriguing. Like, do I live my life in such a way that somebody looks at me and says, oh, he's, God fr- he's God's friend. Oh, that's Debbie. Um, she's God's friend. That's Bob. He's, he's God's friend. That's, that's Jerry. That's Don. Well, they're, they're God's friend. You talk about, uh, that is overwhelming to me. That anybody, that I would ever believe God enough that somebody looked at my life and said, He's God's friend. Ah, man, if I aspired to anything, that's something worth aspiring to. So I asked this question about my friendships. What's my criteria for meaningful, close friendships? Because we use friend in a very generic sense in all different levels. So what's my criteria for who gets close to me and who I want to get close to? What does that look like? What's my criteria for meaning? Meaningful, close relationships. Because we all have friends. You, you could name 50 people that you would say you're friends, but they're not the four or five. I'll talk about this in depth when we talk about men next week. If, if, let's be as authentic as we can in this moment. If you were to ask the men in this room, when your life is really hard, and it's falling apart, who do you call? The vast majority of men in the world would say no one. They would say no one. That's a hard truth. You don't have to like that or agree with it, but most men would say nobody cares. I just want that to sit on us for a minute. That makes it so important that my meaningful, close relationships get the most scrutiny. They get the most effort from me. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen says, like iron sharpens iron, so one person or one man sharpens another. It may be in the version, that you, a version of the Bible that you use often, it says, sharpens the character of of his friend. So my criteria, the people that are close to me, do they sharpen me? Do they ask me hard questions? Do they hold me accountable? Do they sharpen my character? Do they push me in a direction that need that says you need to change the way you think? You need to change the way you act. You need to change do they sharpen me? Am I sharpening them? Proverbs 18:24 says a man of many companions may come to ruin talk about that in a second but there's a friend who sticks close to the brother oftentimes when we see that last phrase it's often referred to jesus that he sticks close to us and brother but a man of many companions may come to ruin why there's too many influences i'm getting too many voices i'm getting too many opinions and sometimes those opinions conflict with each other well you should do this or you should do this and then they those don't e- those aren't even congruent they, they don't match up but if my companions or my friends, we share a sa- same foundation of faith, then I'm less conflicted. Because I know this friend, like whether it's David Hall or whoever, oh, you're going to give me biblical counsel. And you're going to sharpen me. 
You're going you're gonna to ask me right questions, which most of the time we know this. If the question is hard, it's probably right. Oh, no, you're great. You're doing all the right stuff. Oh, it's their fault. If somebody is telling you it's always somebody else's fault, they are not your friend. They're just not. Because we know that's not true. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. So when life falls apart, and it's crashing around you, who do you call, and who is there when life is hard? And so I have experiences in my life where, of my own doing, my life just imploded. Life as I knew it came to an end. And I was lower than I'd ever been. And there are people that were close to me that I was like, oh, now they're gone. And the phrase that I used then was, and I honestly have not used this phrase since then, is that all those people that I thought, not all, because David Hall is an exception to that, as well as a couple other people that I mentioned in this church, they, they were in the wind. You know what I mean by that? They're just gone. And so when you, when you were at that point of going, I, I, can't, I will not survive this. And I've been there. And so if you think in your life that you're the only one that have ever gotten to that point where you went, I don't know how, to, I can't survive this. You're not alone. The devil wants you to think you're alone, but you're not. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 27, 6. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You ever have somebody just kiss your butt all the time? Oh, you're the best. You're the greatest. They're not your friend. They're just not. But when a friend wounds you, when a friend says, what in the world are you doing? When a friend looks at you and says, you're being a bad wife, stop. Well, that hurts. When a friend looks at you and says, why you talk to your wife that way? Oh, that hurts. But they can be trusted. So your criteria, I think the last one is probably the most significant to me. I am a friend to all who fear you and all who follow your precepts. The people who are close to me, they fear God and they do what God says. Those are the people who are going to be closest to me. They fear God and they do what God says. That's it. It's not rocket science. It's hard it's painful to, to keep distance from some people that maybe you really like and they're fun and blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't mean they should be close to you. I'm a friend to all who fear you. Everybody who follows your word, those are the people that I'll be friends with. Those are the people I'll be closest to. That's the foundational part of friendship for us. That's how we measure our friendships. That's how we measure who gets close to us and who we keep a little bit away. Now, the people who are way over there, they can get closer to God. Hopefully, we're, we have those relationships in our lives where we're sharpening each other and we're getting closer to God collectively and individually. But we need to be very deliberate about the foundations of our friendships. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you do bring the right people into our lives all the time. And sometimes those right people are there to sharpen us. And sometimes those right people are there for us to sharpen. But Father, help us to never be naive about our relationships. Father, we cultivate good, godly, healthy relationships. While simultaneously be out in a world that needs to know Jesus. And like the Apostle Paul, we become all things to all men. So that by all possible means we might win some. Father, thank you for your love for us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Glad you were here.